Meanwhile, Psyche was restlessly wandering about day and night in search of her husband, however angry he might be. She hoped to make him relent, either by coaxing him in their own private love language, or by going down on her knees in abject repentance. One day, she noticed a temple on the top of a steep hill. She said to herself, I wonder if my husband is there. So she walked quietly towards the hill, her heart full of love and hope, and reached the temple with some difficulty after climbing ridge after ridge. But when she arrived at the sacred couch, she found it heaped with votive gifts of wheat sheaves, wheat chaplets, and ears of barley, also sickles and other harvest implements, but all scattered about untidily, as though flung down at the close of a hot summer day by careless reapers. She began to sort all these things carefully and arrange them in their proper places, feeling that she must behave respectfully towards every deity whose temple she happened to visit, and implore the help of the whole heavenly family one by one. The temple belonged to the generous goddess Ceres, who saw her busily at work and called out from afar, Oh, you poor Psyche, Venus is furious and searching everywhere for you. She wants to be cruelly revenged on you. I am surprised that you can spare the time to look after my affairs for me or think of anything at all but your own safety. Psyche's hair streamed across the temple floor as she prostrated herself at the goddess's feet, which she wetted with her tears. She implored her protection. I beseech you, goddess, by the corn stalks in your hand, by the happy ceremony of harvest home, by the secret contents of the wicker baskets carried in your procession, by the winged dragons of your chariot, by the furrows of Sicily from which a cruel god once ravished your daughter Persephone, by the wheels of his chariot, by the earth that closed upon her, by her dark descent and gloomy wedding, by her happy torchlit return to earth, and by other mysteries which Leucius, your attic sanctuary, silently conceals. Help me. Oh, please help your unhappy suppliant psyche. Allow me, just for a few days, to hide myself under that stack of wheat sheaves until the great goddess's rage has time had time to cool down, or, if not for so long as that, at least let me have a short rest, because honestly, I am very, very tired, and haven't stopped traveling for a moment since I set out. Ceres answered, Your tears and prayers go straight to my heart, and I would dearly love to help you, but the truth is, I can't afford to offend my niece. She has been one of my best friends for ages and ages, and really has a very good heart when you get to know her. You'd better leave this temple at once and think yourself lucky that I don't have you placed under arrest. Psyche went away, twice as shad as she had come. She had never expected such a rebuff, but soon she saw below her in the valley another beautiful temple in the middle of a dark, sacred grove. She feared to miss any chance, even a remote one, of putting things right for herself, so she went down to implore the protection of the deity of the place, whoever it might be. She saw various splendid offerings hanging from the branches of the grove and from the temple door posts. Among them were rich garments embroidered with gold letters that spelt out the name of the goddess to whom all were dedicated, namely Juno, and recorded the particular favors which she had granted their donors. Psyche fell on her knees, wiped away her tears, and embracing the temple altar, still warm from a recent sacrifice, began to pray. Sister and wife of great Jupiter, I cannot tell where you may be at the moment. You may be residing in one of your ancient temples on Samos. The Samians boast that you were born in their island and spent your whole impassioned childhood there. Or you may be visiting your happy city of Carthage on its high hill, where you are adored as a virgin traveling across heaven in a lion-drawn chariot, or you may be watching over the famous walls of Argos, past which the river Inachus flows, where you are adored as Queen of Heaven, the Thunderer's Bride. Wherever you are, you, whom the whole East venerates as Zygia, the goddess of marriage, and the whole West as Lucina, goddess of childbirth, I appeal to you now as Juno, the Protectress. I beg you to watch over me, in my overwhelming misfortune. 
and rescue me from the dangers that threaten me. You see, Goddess, I am very, very tired and very, very frightened, and I know that you're always ready to help women who are about to have babies if they get into any sort of trouble. Juno appeared in all her august glory and said, My dear, I should be only too pleased to help you, but unfortunately, divine etiquette forbids. I can't possibly go against the wishes of Venus, who married my son Vulcan, you know, and whom I have always loved as though she were my own child. Besides, I am forbidden by law, one of the Fabian laws, to harbor any fugitive slave girl without her owner's consent. Psyche was distressed by this second shipwreck of her hopes, and she felt quite unable to go on looking for her winged husband. She gave up all hope of safety and said to herself, Where in the world or out of it can I turn for help, now that even these powerful goddesses will do nothing for me but express their sympathy? My feet are so tangled in the snares of fate that it seems useless to ask them to take me anywhere else. Where is there a building in which I can hide myself from the watchful eyes of great Venus, even when all the doors and windows are locked? The fact is, my dear Psyche, that you must borrow a little male courage. You must boldly renounce all idle hopes of escape and make a voluntary surrender to your sovereign mistress. It may be too late, but you must at least try to calm her rage by submissive behavior. Besides, after this long, useless search, you have quite a good chance of finding your husband at your mother-in-law's house. Psyche's decision to do her duty was risky and even suicidal, but she prepared herself for it by considering what sort of appeal she ought to make to her mistress. Venus, meanwhile, had declined to use any human agencies in her search for Psyche and returned to heaven where she ordered her chariot to be got ready. It was a burnished gold with coachwork of such exquisite filigree that its intrinsic value, value was negligible compared with its value as a work of art. It had been her husband Vulcan's wedding present to her. Four white doves from the flock, in constant attendance on her, flew happily forward and offered their rainbow-colored necks to the jeweled harness, and when Venus mounted, drew the chariot along at a spanking rate. Behind flew a crowd of naughty sparrows and other little birds that sang out very sweetly in announcement of the goddess's arrival. Now the clouds vanished, the sky opened, and the high upper air received her joyfully. Her singing retinue were not in the least afraid of swooping eagles or greedy hawks, and she drove straight to the royal citadel of Jupiter, where she demanded the immediate service of Mercury, the town crier of heaven, in matter of great urgency. When Jupiter nodded his sapphire brow in assent. Venus was delighted. She retired from his presence and gave Mercury, who was now accompanying her, careful instructions. Brother from Arcady, you know I have never in my life undertaken any business at all without your assistance, and you know how long I have been without news of my runaway slave girl. So you simply must make a public announcement, offering a reward to the person who finds her, and insist on my orders being obeyed at once. Her person must be accurately described so that nobody will be able to plead ignorance as an excuse for harboring her. Here's her dossier. Psyche is the name, and all the particulars are included. She handed him a little book, immediately went home. Mercury did as he was told. He went from country to country, crying out, Oye, Oye, if any person can apprehend and seize the person of a runaway princess, one of the Lady Venus's slave girls by the name of Psyche, or give any information that will lead to her discovery, let such a person go to Mercury, town crier of heaven, in his temple just outside the precincts of Our Lady of the Myrtles, Aventine Hill, Rome. The reward offered is as follows. Seven sweet kisses from the mouth of said Venus herself, and one exquisitely delicious thrust of her honey tongue between his pursed lips. A jealous, competitive spirit naturally fired all mankind when they heard this reward announced, and it was thus that put an immediate end to Psyche's hesitation. She was already near her mistress' gate when she was met by one of the household named Old Habit, who screamed out at once at the top of her voice, 
You wicked slut, you. So you've discovered at long last that you have a mistress, eh? But don't pretend, you brazen-faced thing, that you haven't heard of the huge trouble that you cause us in your search for you. Well, I'm glad you've fallen into my hands, not some other slaves, because you're safe here, safe in the jaws of hell, and there won't be any delay in your punishment either, you obstinate, impertinent baggage. She twisted her fingers in Psyche's hair and dragged her into Venus' presence, though she came along willingly enough. Venus burst into a hysterical laugh of a woman who is desperately angry. She shook her head menacingly and scratched her ear, the right ear, behind which the throne of vengeance is said to be situated. Ah, she cried, so you condescend to pay your respects to your mother-in-law. Is that it? Or perhaps you have come to visit your husband's sickbed, hearing that he's still dangerously ill from the burn you gave him. But make yourself at home. I promise you the sort of welcome that a good mother-in-law is bound to give her son's wife. She clapped her hands for her slaves, anxiety and grief, and, when they ran up, gave Psyche over to them for punishment. They let her off, flogged her cruelly, and tortured her in other ways beside, after which they brought her back to Venus' presence. Once more, Venus yelled with laughter. Just look at her, she cried. Look at the whore. That big belly of hers makes me feel quite sorry for her. By heaven, it wrings my grandmotherly heart. Grandmother indeed. How wonderful to be made grandmother at my time of life, and to think that the son of this disgusting slave will be called Venus's own grandchild. No, but of course that is nonsense. A marriage between a god and a mortal, celebrated in the depth of the country without witnesses, and lacking even the consent of the bride's father, can't possibly be recognized at law. Your child will be a bastard, my girl, even if I permit you to bring it into the world. With this, she flew at poor Psyche, tore her clothes to shreds, pulled out handfuls of her hair, and grabbed her by the shoulders and shook her until she nearly shook her head off, giving her a terrible time. Next, she called for quantities of wheat, barley, millet, lentils, beans, and seeds of poppy and vetch, and mixed them all together in a huge heap. You look such a dreadful sight, slave, said she, that the only way you are ever likely to get a lover is by hard work. So now I'll test you myself, 